Okay, well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> All right, open your Bibles this morning, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. We need to consider one another in order to stir up love, resulting in good works. You know, I really do appreciate the way the scriptures are put together. You know, a lot of times people want to have how-tos. They, they say that. Give me a how-to. Give me an example. You know, they're trying to figure out exactly what's that look like. You know, actually, God does give us the how-tos. We just tend to read over them, though, sometimes. We don't realize he's trying to tell us something. That, you know, sometimes we really don't understand how we think. We don't understand that how we communicate to ourselves that what we see and believe, we actually can achieve. You know, as if you really consider another person, I mean really consider their, them, their situation, that can do something to you, something that God is looking for. I hope to unpackage today what it can, it can do. It can arouse in us compassion, when you really start to see their situation, it might even be somebody that you didn't even like before too much. One of them unlovely types. But you know what? You're human too. And if you take five seconds to think about it, maybe you weren't so lovely yourself either for a while. Because you justify what you did by your intention. Why others have judged you according to your actions, but you realize you do the same thing. You judge other people by what they do and justify yourself by your intent. Because sometimes you do the exact same thing. You go, yeah, well, you do the same thing he do. Well, we're well, just different. We're just different because I did it because of boo, boo, boo. And you start giving all this justification for why you did it. Never occurs to you, you know, maybe they had a justification why they did it too whole lot of unlovely people in this world. But if we would consider one another what we're going through, 
what you're suffering, the burdens we're bearing, each of us, you might start to have compassion, which starts to stir up love. He says, consider it might stir up a little love in you. Not some gushy kind of love, but <clears throat> doing that which is right for another person. Probably going to cost you a little something too, by the way. Real love is self-sacrificing. It's going to cost you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Gave means beaten, spit on, crucified. <clears throat> cost him something. And once you start to love them, considering them, it's going to motivate you to action. Now you're going to do something called good works. Let us consider one another in order to <clears throat> stir up the love resulting in good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Well, why would he throw that in there? Look, how can you be considering other people if you don't even see them? <laughs> you don't even know what they're up to. You have no idea what's going on in their life because it's been... When's the last time you saw the people you graduated from high school with? I mean, those might have been the days back then. Maybe you thought those days would never end. Graduation day, everybody hugging on each other. Uh, you, know, I'm, you know, we'll stay in touch. We'll do... You go to a 40-year reunion and you haven't seen them since the day you graduated from high school. How soon we forget. What about the people of God? We're supposed to be one body. When's the last time... Well... No offense, Troy, I was going to say, when's the last time you saw your right arm? Uh, well, <laughs> been a while. <laughs> well, we have a date, 1979. I mean, normally we're all, the body's attached. Troy can take it. I mean, I wouldn't say it if I didn't think he could. <laughs> Appreciate you letting me use you as an example. November <laughs> The idea is the body is supposed to be together. And if you're missing part of that, I'm sure there is a deficit of perception. You'd never know by talking to Troy, though. I mean, I remember one time up to Northman, I had a, a little bearing on my uh, pop-up trailer. I tried to pack the bearing, and I don't think I did such a good job of telling Troy. He had that trailer jacked up, had them lug nuts off, had that wheel pulled, and was packing that bearing with one hand while I'm standing there handing him tools. So I don't think the guy really knows he's missing a part of his body. But not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is the man of son, but exhorting one another. So much more as we see that day approaching. We are in a process and God has put all the things necessary into the process that we go through to bring about a predictable and desired result that God has for us. We cannot just be overlooking certain things that we are to be about, a part of, or doing that will bring those results out in us. He wants us to be loving each other and he wants us to be involved considering, because this is what Christ did. We read that in Philippians. Let each of you look out for not only his own interest but the interests of others. <clears throat> Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ. Was that not the mind of Christ? Did he only look out for himself. Look, if he would have looked out for himself, these verses down here below, about how he made of himself no reputation, took on the form of a bond, and came in the likeness of man. If he was only thinking about his own interest, that would have never happened. He would have never been down here in the likeness of men. But he didn't think only of himself. 
There was, a, there was a mission to be accomplished. An eternal purpose. Trouble in heaven. His father's name was under attack. The exalted son needed to vindicate his father, glorify his father. There was a battle to fight. Sacrifice to be made. He said, I'm the man. Reminds me of Isaiah 6. When Isaiah saw the Lord glorified and exalted and on the throne, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I've seen the Lord. Angel purges his lips, cleanses him. And the Lord says, well, who, who, who will we send? And who will go for us? Isaiah said, well, here am I, send me. Somebody had to do it. The Lord says, send me. A body you've prepared for me. I come in the bottom of the book. It's written to me. To do your will, O oh God, send me. That's the mind we ought to have. Same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Being in the form of God, didn't consider robbery to be equal, robbery to be equal with God, made himself no reputation, took the form of a bouncer, and came in the likeness of men, and being found in that appearance as a man, humbled himself, became obedient to the point even death on the cross. And because of all that, therefore, it says, therefore God has highly exalted him and given that name which is above every name. Look, we are following his steps. The only way that we are going to get that same glorification, that exaltation, and to be lifted up as we are seated in the heavenly places now in Christ Jesus, it's because we will follow in his steps. We will have the same mind that was in him. So this idea is that we are to esteem others, it says even, better than ourselves. That's what he said. Let nothing be done through selfish, selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. That is not a suggestion. Look, if you want to know how this works, this is how this works. Sometimes we read that stuff and we say, well, yeah, that's pretty cool. I wish others do that to me. Do we do it for others? You know, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Really. The way that you finally understand what it is that we're called to do is in the doing. A good understanding, the Bible says, are all they that do his commandments. Do. See, sometimes we don't realize that by not doing those things... We miss out on a tremendous blessing. We don't get the results in our lives that never occurs to us. Why? We need each other. And we need to have this mind that he had. And we will get the result. See, we don't realize that's how the changes occur. The changes that we should desire. Sometimes people are unlovely. We mentioned that. You know, we agree in principle, yeah, it ought to be that way, but it's a lot easier to love the lovely people, isn't it? The ones that we agree with. The ones that maybe have... Uh, we consider a little bit more like we are. You know, sometimes with people, you know, racial prejudice is a serious thing. Some people just don't like other people just because of, they don't even know them. Had on the news, a <clears throat> young guy got killed in New Jersey. He was a white kid, a good kid, apparently. He was gunned down. And the guy they arrested for it said he did it because a jihad, you know, or because he, the kid was an American or something, and this guy wanted to do it because of the bad things the U.S. was doing somewhere. That's a good reason to kill somebody, right? <clears throat> 
Some people just don't, just don't like other people. Remember when Jesus said they hated me without a cause? There's a lot of people that hate people without cause. No justification for it at all. <clears throat> but yet God so loved the world, notice the world, that he gave his only begotten son. Put Jesus, you know, God, that's his, his nature. He loves. God is love. And in Romans 5, it tells us when we were still without strength, verse 6 says, in due time Christ died for who? The ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man one would die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die, but God demonstrated his own love toward it. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice how they put that, or that it says here. Scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But what about the unlovely ones? That's what it says God did. God demonstrated his own love toward us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died. Well, that sure takes it up a few notches, doesn't it? <clears throat> you know what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Remember when he said, you know, if you only love your brother... You only salute those that salute you. What reward do you have? The publicans, he said, do that. The publicans do that. In other words, you haven't done nothing. You know, Christianity is the religion of the second mile, not the compulsory first mile. <clears throat> Ephesians 2 makes it pretty clear. Look, we were all in that. And unlovely. He made you alive, Paul said, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, speaking of Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves and lost of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as other. Pretty unlovely. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we was dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace he, we've been saved, raised us up, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Notice what he says. By grace you've been saved, verse 8 says, through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. For we are created for good work. And we need to consider one another in order to stir up the love that will manifest in good works toward each other. And not only to the household of faith, but we've been admonished by Scripture to do good to all men. Especially those of the household of faith. <clears throat> Well, how are we going to do that? He said, consider one another. Think about each other. Think about your brother. What's he going through? Maybe he bugs you sometimes. Well, why does he bug you? You realize that sometimes when you're bugged by somebody else, it's only because it's bringing out something that's in you. That's why we don't like them. Do you know that's why they killed the Lord? They hated him without a cause. What was it about him that infuriated them where Jesus of Nazareth was concerned? His light, his goodness revealed their darkness and their evil. He was the nicest guy on the block, man. He didn't do nothing to nobody. And yet they hated him. So you might consider that if somebody's really rubbing your fur the wrong way, well, in order to turn this thing around, consider what's going on with you. We want to consider one another so that our compassion will be stirred up. Look, Jesus says, look, <clears throat> 
You see, the religious guys found fault. He calls Matthew, whose book I'm in, Matthew 9 and 9, he was a tax collector. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, follow me. Now you know the Jews didn't like the tax collectors, because they're Jewish, working for the Romans, and extorting more money from the people than what they should have been. Now verse 10 says, it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, said, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came, sat right down with the man, his disciples, and when the Pharisees saw, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those that are well don't have any need of a physician, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus sat with the publicans and the sinners. He understood the sick need the physician. Now you got a great example of that, Luke 19. You got this guy, Zacchaeus, verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. If he's a chief tax collector and he's rich, he's doing a good job of ripping these people off is what he's doing. You think they liked him? Not only that, he was short. He was little. Some people don't like little people. That probably just made him matter. Just hated him all the more. He was chief tax collector. He was rich and he was short. He sought to see Jesus, but could not because of the crowd, because he was of short stature. So he ran ahead, climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, and he was going as he was. Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up some and said, "Zacchaeus, make haste, come down today. I must stay at your house." He made haste, came down, received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they complained, saying, "He's gone in to be guest with a man that's a sinner." Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. Jesus said, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of, this man a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. You know, do you think Jesus knew that guy was going to be up in that tree? Well, look, if he knew where they could send him, he could send the disciples to go in to find the colt and the foal of the donkey or find the man walking with the pitcher of water, I guess he could probably figure out that he needed a, a teaching moment. A teaching moment. So here's this despised publican that nobody likes, but Jesus knew there's something else cooking inside that guy that most people wouldn't even try to find out or even care. But Jesus knew that guy's climbing a tree to see the Lord. So Jesus makes sure that he goes right under that tree and calls his name. Make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. Have lunch at your house, that kid. Man, he is happy he comes down. Lord, if... I give half my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from, by any, from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. Jesus said salvation has come to this house because this guy is a son of Abraham, and I've come to seek and to save the lost. He needed salvation. He needed a physician. Do you realize that God knows our potential? That's why he can be merciful and be patient with us. Now, this, this, just a little sidebar, not much, but I just got to point this out. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3, My brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it's safe. Now beware of dogs. Beware of the dogs, the evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. He's talking about the Jews, the bad ones, the unrepented, the narrow-minded, pharisaical ones. Beware of dogs. Now, them are not the four-legged lassies out there that, you know, or the Rin Tin Tins he's talking about. 
There are some bad to the bone individuals out there. Evil workers. But you know, when he called Matthew from that tax collecting table, don't you think he knew that there was more going on inside of Levi, Zacchaeus, you and me? He maybe considered us. Matthew 9, it says that he looked and saw these multitudes wandering around the last part of chapter 9. Matthew 9. Verse 36. Well, verse 35. He, Jesus went to all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to the disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out the labors into the harvest. They, they need help out there. When he went through all the villages and their cities and he was teaching in those synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom, he's looking at these people. They were sick, they had disease, they were pain, they're suffering. And he sees them, man, they're just people. They're basically lost, wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. You realize that's what you see out there today in the world? Such were some of us, right? Before BC. I never thought of myself as really wanting to be bad or hurt people, but man, I did a lot of things I regret. Because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And there's influences and they're powerful. Man, the mindset, the mindset to the flesh, minds of things of the flesh, whether you want to go there or not. Buddy, you're going. You might be working on the roof and you start to slide because you didn't secure yourself. Well, you probably don't want to fall off the roof, but guess what? You're going to and you're going to hit the ground. It's going to hurt. He saw them and it aroused the compassion in him that motivated him to want to do something about it. <clears throat> I think of some of the works, you know, that have been going on. Them dresses, I like them dresses. Man, that's a... But if you ever talk to Linda Nichols, you'll find out. I don't think that woman will ever quit making them dresses because she's got this thing in her mind. I got to make it, you know, one, one more. She lays awake at night and thinks about getting another dress out there. Because she thinks of a little girl that needs that dress. And if I, she can get that dress to her, it could keep her from being assaulted. We've said it up here before, you know, and I read in the Half the Sky book, they said a new dress on a little girl can keep her from being raped in a, some of these third world hole in the ground countries. Why is that? Because she has value. They perceive it as having value. When she's dressed in rags or doesn't have any clothes, then she's free game. And that just drives Linda nuts, just the thought of it. You've got to get one more dress out there. You see what happens? By considering that little girl, considering her situation, man, that suddenly motivates, stirs up, Compassion, love, which means action. Got to do something. We got to do something. What if you don't care about little girls with no clothes, no dress? There's people like that. They could care less. What was the, the Christmas carol, Ebenezer Scrooge? Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? You know, let somebody else take care of that. What they're doing over there is amazing. And some of the news that we get, the feedback, Linda shares some of that. Yeah, I'll tell you what, like Jim Spinotti says, that'll bring tears to glass eyes, man. Some of the stories. 
about the girls getting the dresses. I remember when I was reading Wild at Heart or whatever, one of the books, I was the name Eldridge wrote, and he was talking about the haunting. That in all of us, there's sometimes something that you just see it just right, maybe, an old, maybe a song or a situation, a child's face, something, and all of a sudden, boom! It's like getting hit with a baseball bat. I mean, it hits you for a minute. Stirs something, then kind of fades, you know? You've, I think we've all been there. We've all seen that. I've had images stuck in my mind, you know, that I can't shake sometimes. I was in an orphanage one time with Thais. Actually, it was a shelter. We we're getting a little tour, we're going around. There was a little girl. We looked in a room, and there was an attendant, a woman, who just apparently woke up this little girl from her nap or something. She's probably two. The attendant was trying to help her get her, her pants on, was trying to, her little girl's hair was all messed up. And you know, sometimes you wake a kid up from the nap and they're crying. But this girl was really crying and shaking and just in utter terror. We stood outside the door, didn't go in, and Thais and I were side by side. And it was the saddest little picture I ever saw, this little kid. And the attendant was trying to comfort her and get her dressed. And later when we left, we were in Thais's car. I said, man, that really gets to me. You know, see that little girl like that, just crying as hard as she was and shaking, you know. And Thais said, the crying doesn't bother me. It was a fear in her eyes, the terror. And I thought, man, that was it. That's what I saw. And that little girl was looking at us, looking at her, not knowing us as strangers. Because we were told she'd been taken away from her mother and father because they're alcoholic and a wreck, a mess, and the little girl's taken. You know, the little girl don't understand about alcohol. That's her mom and dad. She's in an institution now in a shelter of people they don't even know. And she was terrified. Man, that just stirs me up deep inside, you know. Compassion. It provokes me to, to love and to want to do something to help. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Unless we totally are heartless and don't care. The Buddhist nun at the Vietnamese orphanage we go to, she was telling us one time about some need that she had there, and she was crying, and Bach was translating. She needed clothes, the uniform clothes, for the kids to go to school, because if they go to the school without those uniform clothes, then in just orphan clothes, every, all the other kids pick on them. They bully them because they know they're orphans. It's like their life ain't tough enough as it is. So we gave the money so that she could send the kids to school with the uniforms on. They had value. You can't hear stories like that and not be stirred as you consider the lives of other people. Starting with ourselves, our brother. If we can't have compassion stirred up for one another to begin to love each other through our faults and all our problems that we all have, and be motivated to engage in each other's lives, good works, Christ to each other in this generation and to the world. You know, we're going through James over the era, and you know this, these passages, but we'll just look at it real quick. Remember what James says about meeting the need. It's a good thing to meet the need. What is a prophet, my brother, in James 2 and 14, if someone says he has faith but hasn't any works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you don't give them the things necessary for the body, what good is that? Thus also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. In 1 John three sixteen. But this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Well, you ain't going to lay your life down for the brethren if you don't consider him. 
and have compassion and love, demonstrating it by what we do for one another. Whoever has this world's good, sees a brother in need, shuts up his heart from him. Well, how does the love of God abide in him? My children, let us not just love in word and tongue, but in deed and in truth. Commit to action. Let's wrap it up here. Look, we got an example of somebody obviously didn't have any time but for nothing but himself. Luke 16. You know the story. In Luke 16, Jesus tells the story. There was a certain rich man clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, laid right outside his gate. He desired to be fed with even just crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was. The beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. Abraham said, Son, remember, your lifetime you had the good things. Lazarus had evil things, and buddy, you knew it. He was right outside your gate. You had to swerve that big stretch chariot around him to keep from running over him. And chase the dogs away. But now he's comforted and you're tormented. Besides all this, between us and you, there's this great gulf fix. Those who would want to pass from here to you cannot, nor those from there can pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they come to this place of torment. Abraham said, Son, though your brothers have Moses and the prophets, your brothers have the scriptures, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father, Abraham, but if one go to them from the dead, they will repent. He said, If they will not hear Moses, the prophets, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, and Mary, neither will they be persuaded, even though one rose from the dead. Look, we got Scripture. Scripture can't be broken. Scripture endures forever. Two men, both, by context reveals they're both Jews. Rich man's a Jew. Your brothers have Moses and the prophets. He's, he's Jewish. He's in hell. He's only obviously, maybe that like Ebenezer Scrooge, you know, he's only concerned about his own self. Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? He wasn't going to do nothing from that guy that just wanted some crumbs that fell from the table. Genesis 4 and 9, remember when Cain killed Abel? God said, where's your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Jesus said that Zacchaeus was the son of Abraham. Jesus said he came to seek and to save the lost. I guess that would make Zacchaeus Jesus' brother. Am I my brother's keeper? I guess so. That's in Genesis chapter 4. Do you think that's changed? We are our brother's keeper. We can't look at the multitude and not have compassion for them wandering as sheep without shepherds. But we've got to be concerned about the household of God too. That's why the Hebrew writer says, consider one another because it will stir up love. Resulting in action. Good works. You can't see a child like I've seen just shaking and crying with terror in their eyes. I saw a little girl one time in Afghanistan. I saw the garbage pile was big as this church building. And kids were on top of it. And I remember just seeing this little girl lean back as far as she could lean back and look to me like she was pulling a sweater out of that dump. And she was probably three years old. Your kids get their clothes out of the dump? It's hard to get those images out of your mind once you've seen them. 
Yeah, I don't think the Lord wants us to get him out of our mind. Obviously, this rich guy, it wasn't in his mind at all. He could have cared less. And he found he'll have a long time to think about that. Like forever. So, if we want the result, if we want the blessing seated in those heavenly places, those unlovely ones like we've all been, God showed us that kind of compassion, that kind of mercy, and we need to show it not only for each other here, but for those that are outside. Thanks for your attention this morning.